love to love life. Life is incredible. And I don't want to get through my my months and my years and look back and think, yeah, I, I flowed with life. I want to squeeze the energy and the love and the joy and the excitement and the passion out of it that I can. And so so I think that making a work-life balance or making a balanced life, a lot of that is deciding to have passion about the things mm. that you want to have as habits in your life. You, you, you have to choose it. Welcome to the Happy Engineer podcast, the place where we help engineers like you to build your career, balance your life, and be happy. I'm Zach White, former engineer turned lifestyle engineering coach and your host for the journey to the career and life that you desire. Hey, I believe that you shouldn't have to sacrifice your life to reach your full potential at work. And what we're going to bring you in these conversations and interviews are the strategies, the tools, and the mindsets that are going to allow you to experience both success at work and success at home. Hey, we do the best we can to keep this free from advertisements. Of course, I can't control what YouTube may throw up, but do us a favor and share this podcast with anybody who you think may like it. And don't forget to click the bell and subscribe and get notifications to our YouTube channel and for upcoming releases of the Happy Engineer podcast. I would love your feedback and even more than that, love your story. Share with us how these strategies and tools are working for you. Would love to be in touch with you. Connect with us on social media. Find me at Oasis of Courage on Instagram, Facebook, or Zach White on LinkedIn. It's an absolute pleasure to serve you. Now let's do this. Welcome back, my fellow lifestyle engineers. It's amazing to be with you. I'm here today with the most amazing woman you're ever going to meet. Seika Mejour is a wife, a mother, and a multi-passionate entrepreneur, co-owns and operates a new space headhunting firm at Astra. Seika is particularly passionate about leadership and professional relationship building in a fast-paced and super high-tech industry. Seika is a mentor and a coach for high performers. I know all my clients are going to love seeing Seika here who had a chance to work with Seika as a coach. Also a new mother to a five-month-old boy, a longtime animal lover, an indoor cycle instructor, 15-year yogi, home chef, event planner, and a researcher and published author of academic literature. You can find publications from Seika in the International Journal of Stress Management and in Psychology Today. Seika and Brian completed a 21-country vegan voyage before starting Ad Astra. It's just an awesome story. I hope we get to touch on that today. They traveled around the globe, made some incredible friends, took adventures as they came, interviewed some top chefs, and enjoyed cuisine from around the globe, reduced barriers to a plant-based lifestyle, and blogged about how easy and fun it can actually be to travel vegan. I imagine I could go on and on and on about this amazing woman. Sega, thank you so much for making time to be with us today. Yeah, it's a true pleasure to be here, Zach. Okay, I got to back up for a second. I've known you for a while. It's always fun to chat with you, and there's something unique and amazing that comes up every time. But when I was reading through all these amazing points of your story and your journey, one of them for me was not like the others. And of course, it's a really diverse background in general. But when I picture an indoor cycle instructor... <laughs> I have this image of a boom mic and like loud music and just this uh, working up a sweat with a room full of people and doing cardio. And it really doesn't vibe with me on the 15 year yogi home chef vegan side of Seiko. So I got to understand what's the story with the indoor cycle instructor? Oh my goodness. Have you taken in, have you taken indoor cycle? I, I confess I have never done an indoor cycling class. 
So the first couple are brutal, right? You are exhausted. You're, you're, you know, a little sore from sitting on the seat and they, they're a little rough. And then after that, there's this intensity in being in the room and the music and having, being able to motivate the, the room that you're writing with, getting this incredible cardio workout. But there's something spiritual about it almost. And I, I fell in love with with indoor cycle and decided to become a, an instructor a while ago and it's a thrilling experience so of course it's only on the side I'm uh, you know I've got a lot going on but it's a passion of mine for sure there's something spiritual about it I I love this and just to hear the passion in your voice talking about it so what is that process like to become a cycle instructor is this a difficult thing or is not that not that hard like what you have to go through to become one so if you're already an avid indoor cyclist, right, you've got the kind of endurance and spirit for indoor cycle already. After that point, it's not too difficult. If you're maxing out your indoor cycle classes, when you take them with another instructor, all you're going to do after that point is get certified. And it's like, you know, one weekend that you take to get certified. I have two different certifications. Both of them, I think, were a two-day process pretty simple and and then you find a, a gym or two that you can teach at and it's pretty direct maybe zooming out for i'm sure the engineer list is like what is he doing why are we talking about this <laughs> you, i mean one of the things that comes up again and again as a coach for engineers is how are we finding balance in life and to have an area of passion and just even the enthusiasm i feel from you about this area that's really completely separate from what you do and the value and the work that you do in the world. So for you, how important is it to have these outlets and to really take it sort of to the next level, not to just go to the gym on occasion, but to pursue that with some more intensity? What is it that for you draws you to take it to that next step? And what advice would you have for people around how to balance in that way? I love that question. It's really, really insightful. I, what, I, I love to love life life is incredible. And I don't want to get through my my months and my years and look back and think, yeah, I, I flowed with life. I want to squeeze the energy and the love and the joy and the excitement and the passion out of it that I can. And so I could hate working out, right? I could begrudgingly get my workout in or skip it most days or, you know, begrudgingly put on my shoes when I go for a run or go to lift weights, or I could decide that it's something that I'm passionate about and not just participate in it, but take it as my own and make it into something that I, I really love. Uh, it's a similar thing about being a chef. And I don't just eat healthy food because I know it's better for me and you know, yeah. you gotta eat lettuce. I turn it into, I love cooking. And I love being able to contribute that to the people who are in my life. So I think that making a work-life balance or making a balanced life, a lot of that is deciding to have passion about the things mm. that you want to have as habits in your life. You, you, you have to choose it. I love to love life. Most people I talk to, Seika, see that quality, that passion that you described as something that's part of maybe their personality. I either am that kind of person who's really passionate or I'm not. You're telling us it's a decision to become passionate about squeezing the juice out of life. How did you come to that conclusion? Like, how do we know that's true? Yeah. Awesome question. So I'd say for people who are wondering, hey, is that true? Give it a trial run. Give it a trial run. Say what's something, pick something that you wish that you did that you hate right now. I'm not even mm. going to say pick something that you like kind of don't like. No, give it a real go. Pick something that you don't like that you really would like to have as a habit in your life and give it a real passion trial. Give it Two weeks, right, of saying every morning you wake up, you say, I love this thing. And you think about all the different ways that you can love it. I'm sore after I work out. I love being sore after I work out. I feel like I'm getting stronger. I can, I can feel my body. I, 
I'm moving with my body, this body that I have, right, that I'm using in life all the time. It can either be something I ignore or passively am part of, or I can be excited about being partnered with this body every day. So I'd say give it a trial run. It's worked. I've been using this decide to be passionate about something. I think the first time I, I remember using it, I think I was in high school and there were, there was a class that I was having a really tough time with. And I was like, I can either decide to have a grudge against this or take responsibility for my outcomes and decide to get passionate and thrilled about it. I love this. So what's even more powerful about the way you framed that is don't take one of your favorite things and decide to just notch it from a nine to a 10. Take that thing that you wish you liked. Maybe you, you really want that in your life or you see someone else enjoying it in a passionate way. And it's like, I would love to be like that. Or maybe you've dreaded it, but you know, it's really, really good for you. And make a decision to go for two weeks full out. Give it not just the college try, but the full go. I, I just love this. I hope everyone listening will will take that to heart. And I'm curious for you, Seiko, right now in your life, is there any area that you are having to choose passion where it wouldn't happen automatically? Oh, that's a great question. It's it's become a bit of a muscle for me. So when I when I have an area that I'm I'm really not liking and I, I notice myself butting up against something, I I try to pause and yeah, not perfect at it, but I try to pause and say, I have two choices. I can either change the thing that I'm butting up against. Or I can change my attitude about the thing that I'm butting up against. And, yes. and I try to take one of those two paths. I'd say, <laughs> so yeah, so you're pushing me here, ch challenging me. I love it. So something that is a, I'd say this is one of my more ingrained ones that I, I still struggle with. I, uh, my uh, Clifton, are you familiar with Clifton Strength Finder? Yes. Yeah. So my number one, I've taken it a variety of times. Sometimes my, you know, uh, my lower strengths change a little bit. My number one is always achiever. And I, I really like to get things done. And for me, that looks like making a list of things, organizing my schedule, blocking out my habits and getting sure. things done. What that means is strength overuse becomes a weakness, right? What that means is that I have a really hard time being flexible. Now, that benefits me in a lot of ways. I stick to my plans. I'm extremely reliable. If I say I'm going to do something, I'm going to do it. I don't flex out of that very much. But when a great opportunity arises, and I've just, I've already, I already have the day planned, right? No commitments to anybody else, but in my mind, I've already committed my day to something. A great opportunity arises. Uh, the choice is almost not in my box to get flexible about it. So mm. funny that you ask me how I'm using this in my day today. Today, the universe works in mysterious ways, right? So today this came up and my husband, Brian, who dear listeners will get to have a conversation, hear a conversation with later. Very, very cool guy brought up an idea for a very cool opportunity that we could take advantage of today. And my reaction is to kind of lock up, go, mm -mm. not in the plan, <laughs> not in the plan. Exactly. It's not in the plan. Now, is there space for it? Yeah, totally. He has great ideas and he does not have the same kind of r rigid uh, format that my personality is kind of bent in, built into, but I love the guy and he's got brilliant ideas. And so I really tried to work with myself there and go, how can I get excited about this? How, yes. how can I find passion for not just believing in his ideas, but also in being excited about the flexibility around this? And I was able to find a lot of freedom, right? My, my muscles relax, like my breath get a little deeper and find opportunities to not just be okay with the flexibility, but even come up with some, a few new ideas to, to increase flexibility around this. I love it. Build on it, make even more from it. And, you know, the listener you can't see your, your posture there, but Roy, just even seeing in the physical body, like, oh, I'm relaxing into this. And then from that place, able to take it further. I, this is super important, deciding to be passionate. And I think engineers as a group are not 
categorized as the most, I'll say, emotionally extreme in terms of passion, maybe passionate about their technology or passionate about the information, but you don't always see, especially outside of engineering, a lot of passion. And yet I, I think that's sometimes just because we've decided, well, I've only got Maybe I'm a gearhead. That's my one thing, but I don't want to share that with people or being a cycling instructor. Like, are you kidding me? No way. But I love this. Pick something and go for it. Speaking of passion, then this 21 country vegan voyage. And I know you and Brian have talked about this in some other podcasts and there's the blog and people can really dig deep into this. We could talk for hours about the amazing experiences you had, but passion, courage, adventure, so many things that come up in this. Of that entire journey, I know this is going to be tough. You could take it whatever direction you want, Seika, but what is a moment in that entire voyage that stands out to you as the, the place where you encountered the greatest fear, that scariest moment of the trip? What would pop into your mind for that? <laughs> Actually, not hard. <laughs> so, not a difficult thing for me. Uh, it was. It was. It was really clear. So, we traveled. We traveled all over the place. We were in very many different cultures. We started in Japan, worked our way through Asia, Africa. The, the, uh, you know, we were in Tanzania, Egypt, Dubai. We went through Euro Europe and and ended in in Iceland specifically. Vietnam was an area that I had a really hard time with culture, the culture, um, what is it called, the, the dissonance, my, my understanding of how the culture worked in a big city was really trying to figure out there, there's a lot of noise. There's honking and yelling and a lot of people. And when you go to cross the street, it's a totally different culture. It's a totally different a system for driving and walking. When you go to walk cross the street, there isn't a crosswalk and cars don't stop. And what they tell you to do as a tourist is to step into the road and keep your cadence. And there's honking and there are cars and motorbikes going by you in every direction. Very the their personal space bubbles are very different sizes. So they're it, culturally, it's much uh, it's appropriate to get much closer to your body than it is in America. We have much larger kind of mm -hmm. personal space yeah. uh, comfort levels, and that was that was it was scary. It was it took a lot of of courage and willingness to accept a different environment to move through uh, Vietnam, uh, Hanoi sp specifically. What do you learn about yourself in this idea of step into the road, keep the cadence? That's a really interesting phrase, and I've never heard it before. And honestly, it's kind of making my heart rate go up a little bit just thinking about it. Like the faith there in a, a car is not just going to slam into me. Like, how does that change you to have to face everyday life with that idea of step into the road, keep the cadence? Like, Tell me about that evolution in your life. Yeah, so the work that we do at Ad Astra, we're both interviewing engineers and then we're connecting them with teams who are going to need to rely on them for everything. Putting literally putting hardware into space. And that idea from Hanoi uh, step into the road and keep your cadence was a very interesting exercise and a new muscle for me to to get a lot of experience with of mm. realizing how individuals the interactions that people have are so different from culture to culture and from individual to individual in America we, we would never step into the road with a car moving toward us at that speed or accept a car getting that close to our bodies and not thinking that we are in fear or not being in fear from a vehicle being that mm -hmm. close to our body. And uh, having a willingness to accept these different perspectives and these different ways of physically moving around the world gives me a lot of insight into coaching and building teams where you have to have a lot of space for different people's perspectives and communication styles and understandings of 
how to do this complex work that we're doing. What's it like the first time? So for the you know, person who's listening, like, okay, step into the road, keep the cadence, sure. But at some point, you still have to make that first step happen. You know, what's it like the first time or what advice would you have for someone who's at that point where you either you got to turn around and go another way or it's time to take the first step? What was that like for you? What'd you learn? Yeah. So, well, for me, I closed my eyes and held on to somebody with more confidence. So I gripped Brian's arm, yeah. right? him step into the road and keep the cadence and he was quite comfortable with it and that gave me an opportunity to you know be guided by his mentorship is a funny word to use here but in some ways it is right you see somebody who's able to do it with confidence and uh, figure out how to model their success that's a great reminder w with modeling people who've gone the road before you know, where, where else do you see that as the strategy to success for facing fear? Are there times when that's always the way you should go? Or are there times maybe to avoid that? Like, be careful about just following. What do, what do you think about that as a strategy? Oh, gosh, such, that's, a, that's a whole topic for, for a conversation by itself. Yeah, I, I think that uh, when, when, gosh, I think that to put it simply, reviewing successful individuals and assessing which pieces of those of, of those behaviors ring true to yourself is a vital component of developing your experience. I think that we can it can be dangerous to or it could hold someone back to just try to model how somebody else has done it. Yeah. Uh, there a few reasons they you might be set up to reach even higher levels than the person that you're modeling and if you're trying to mimic every step you might not get there the most successfully you, we got to do life with our own history informing each step and i think that if we're just trying to copy the footsteps of somebody else we might miss some opportunities for some real integrity authenticity and yeah. letting ourselves reach our own levels you said something there that's really subtle but i think it's important that we highlight the fact that sometimes your mentor or your role model may actually be holding you back from your full potential if you've already learned what you need to learn from that person. And frankly, it's no judgment on their part. It could just be that your path is going to exceed anything that they've ever done. And being aware of when has that relationship maybe run its course, or at least needs to shift in the frame to where you unleash yourself from this idea that I'm underneath their mentorship. How, how do you become more sensitive to that for the engineer listening? They have a mentor today. Maybe they want to know like, Oh, wow. That's a really interesting thought. Am I at a point where this is actually breaks rather than gas in my fuel? What would you say to that person? Oh, I love it. Yeah. Getting into the, this whole idea of, of limiting beliefs and one of the bigger areas of figuring out, of figuring out how to conquer these limiting beliefs, probably, frankly, I don't know, 85% of the work is figuring out what those limiting beliefs are. Because we run on this programming that's informing, that's telling the story of our lives, right? And we've got these stories that we're telling ourselves that, that give us rules for our lives. And they're made up. Most of those rules we made up or we mm. inherited up rules. And figuring out what those rules are that we're telling ourselves and then figuring out how to rewrite that script is where... A lot of the magic that I've found in life comes from that. It, it, that's we're coming. We're circling back around a little bit to if one of the scripts you're telling you, it's easy to talk about it with with exercise, right? If one of the scripts you tell yourself is I hate cardio, mm. or one of the scripts you tell yourself is I hate going to the gym. Oh, it's exhausting. This is something that in our culture is we we like to say this one. We like to have this as a limiting belief. 
once you realize that that's a story you're telling yourself, if you can rewrite that script that your system is running on to say, I love going to the gym. I'm a gym rat. That's my new identity. Being in the gym is one of my passions. Mm. You're just writing the code that you're running on. And so the limiting beliefs that we can give ourselves is, oh, my mentor is so much farther along than I'll ever be. They're so much smarter than I am. Most of the mentors that I've had in my life are, are incredible people. And they're usually very motivated to see their mentees do even bigger things than they've yeah, done. Totally. I love this statement. You are writing the code you're running on. So let's get really tactical with this. We're engineers. We want to understand, okay, what is this all about? You're, you're talking coach language on me. Say, so go this limiting belief and scripts. And I don't know what you mean. So let's bring it into the world of of talent, headhunting, career transition. You live in this world, in your business. You all do amazing work helping engineers in, in aerospace to find awesome roles and top talent people who are looking for that next opportunity and promotions. So what is an example of a limiting belief or a script that you see holding an engineer back who's seeking that next promotion or a career transition to their dream company or you know, that dream position? What's a specific example that you see a lot in your work? Yeah, so a couple a couple of, of examples are, I'm not a strong communicator. Mm. This interpersonal stuff, not a strength of mine. Another one is <laughs> when people have, have had technical experience throughout their career that's gotten them to a certain point, and they realize they don't love the work, but this is what they've been doing. This is what their career has come to. That's a limiting belief that can hold people back from opening their mind to say, hey, what am I passionate about, right? Because at that point, you have two choices. You can either let your history inform what you're passionate about and redirect your energy to go after that. Or you can get passionate about the work that you're doing. Those are your two choices yeah. if you want to be experiencing the fullness of your life, right? Or there's there, there are other options, but they're not fun ones. You can continue to begrudgingly be in the role that you're in that you don't like and be one of the people who runs on a script of, I don't like my work. So with, with those limiting beliefs, they're, well, go ahead. Oh, I don't want to stop this train. <laughs> Sake, you're on a roll. So go ahead and run with, with the, one of those examples. You know, if we're listening, or, hey, you know what? Maybe let's take that communication example. An engineer yeah. is hearing this and saying, well, yeah, that's me. I'm, I'm a stereotypical engineer. I'm really good at technical stuff, but I'm not so great at communicating. So if that story is in their head, if that's the code that they're running on today, what's the first step to get away from that old programming? Yeah, great, great question. So one thing to realize is that if you've been running this code for a while, it's been informing the experiences that you've had in life. So if this was a code that, that you decided on or someone told you or you told yourself early on, communication is not a strong suit of mine. I'm good with the, with the technical stuff, not the communication that holds me back in my career holds me back in my relationships. That's going to be a, uh, it's going to be reinforced because as you, as you continue to lean into that programming, the experiences that you have kind of pile on top. You go, I've got a lot of examples of how this programming is true because I've been living it for two decades. Well, let's try to get out of that. Some ways that you could try to rewrite that code is one, realize and acknowledge what that script is and that you are the one writing it. And then start brainstorming how you can break yourself out of that pattern. What does that look like? Does that look like investing in a program like Oasis of Courage, right? Where you're going to get to have these, these connections with individuals, have these opportunities to communicate at this deep and uh, high emotionally intelligent levels. 
Is that joining a program like Toastmasters? Is that getting starting your own group of people and the entire focus of this group is to enhance this area of your life that you're now very passionate about, which is strength of communication. Mm. You, you get to, just because you've told yourself a story, a rule about you doesn't mean that you have to continue living it. I, I promise I didn't ask Seika to mention Oiko in her answer there, but yeah. I do really encourage everybody, you know, if you need help with this topic, a great coach like Seika, or if it's with me and with Oiko like, or with someone else, get the help because these limiting beliefs, these scripts, this code that you've been running off of can be holding you back in a lot of areas. And Seika, I want to share something that you set up that really triggered for me. I want to see if you agree with this statement that there aren't actually that many choices. Once you have decided, I want to be passionate about my career, or once you decide, I want to be a happy engineer, I'm not going to settle for less. If you've gotten to that point, then there aren't that many choices. You, know, you, you take action in one of these two directions and go. You either figure it out how to shift your direction from that past data, or you make the choice to get passionate where you're at. But you got to start moving down one of those paths. I feel like we have this illusion of, of choice sometimes that there's, well, there's so many, there's a million things I could do and I'm paralyzed by choice. There's just so many choices, but really, if you want to be happy and passionate in this way, it's not actually that many choices. Do, do you agree with that? Absolutely. The, the weight of these choices is not that heavy. You just have to decide and open your mind and heart to where does this path take me? I love that. So, Sega, your expertise in recruiting and headhunting, I would be in big trouble if we didn't at least spend a couple of minutes unpacking some wisdom and some nuggets for people who are looking at career transition. You know, they're, they're seeking to change companies. They want to get that dream job at one of the big tech organizations. or They're in aerospace and they want to come find you to give, give you their resume to find a, a job at SpaceX or whatever that is. Give us the 80-20. Where do I want to invest my time and energy, if I'm an engineer seeking a career transition into a new organization, what are the most important places for me to spend time? Is it the perfect cover letter? Is it mastering resume keywords? You know, like what for you is on that short list of this is where you want to really invest time and energy if that's you seeking transition? Yeah, absolutely. I have so many thoughts on this, so I'll try to keep it really concise and quick. So number one is once you have a vision of what your dream job or your dream company is. Hold to on. Build Big assumption. <laughs> Do you have a clue what that vision is? Uh, does that need to be bullet zero before we even get to bullet one? <laughs> It's great if it is. It's great if it is. It doesn't have to be. You, you know, a lot of people move around life without having a really clear vision. I will tell you, if you can have, a, in yoga, we call it a dristi, right? A focal point that lets you do these balance poses that you otherwise would not be able to do. If you have that goal, that vision of where you're aiming, the path there and the decisions to get there are going to be so much easier. So it's, it's a whole lot easier if you know where you're going. Okay. I'm sorry I interrupted you. I, just, I wanted people to hear that. That I love that. What's the yoga word you just used? Dristi. That's amazing. I'm going to look that up. So a focal point. Now, once we have that, what's number one? So you want to look at, at your experience and any pieces that are missing for that dream position, for that focal point that you're looking at. How do you need to complement your experience or the skills that you already have that are transferable? How can you tell that story to help paint the picture that you are the perfect candidate for this position? I think the easiest golden nugget of information that I can give to people is you want to make it so easy for someone to see at a glance why you are the right fit for this position. That does not mean a 12 point font, single spaced, multi-page cover letter because people aren't gonna read that much text unless yes. they already 
believe you were the right person. You have got seconds, like a few seconds to tell the story quickly Mm. that you were the right person. So if you're trying to get into this position with your own application, your, your own resume being the piece of paper that's going to get you the position, which I won't say is the easiest or most effective way for people to get in, but it is one of the uh, most common or it's the, it's the lowest energy in the very beginning to get your word out there, right? It's one of, it's yep. a piece that you're going to have anyway, is going to yep. have to have a strong resume. Being able to network your way into positions is going to be a really strong method of getting in there. And networking has kind of a dirty reputation. Networking is so important and it has to be done well in order to be as fruitful as it can be. Because what it really is about is building friendships and relationships with people who you can help and you have mutual passions that, that overlap and you can support each other in getting to where you need to be. There's so much I want to unpack there. And I know we're, we're short on time and I want to be respectful of your time today. So I could, if somebody is saying, okay, networking, what's the best technique? I know we got a lot of really tactical minded engineers out there. Is it LinkedIn messaging? Is it finding ways to cold call people or do I need to send an old school letter in the mail? Or what would you say? What's kind of proven to be, if you're going to invest some energy, here's a good technique to, to go down that route of networking. So I would say I can't answer that quickly. And part mm. of why I can't answer it quickly is because so much is in the nuance. Mass cold calling people can could stir up some really valuable relationships Or it could ruin your reputation if you're doing it really badly, right? It could make you seem like there's something very strange going on. Or you could make a bunch of new friends, depending on how it's approached. So I wouldn't want to answer that very quickly. I I, I would LinkedIn and, and finding people with common interests and reaching out with some, uh, some, pr- I would say an art, but it's really not it's something you can practice and something you can, a skill you can hone to make really effective, but you want to do it with a careful hand. Yeah. You know, this is probably validating a lot of people's concern or curiosity of, frankly, this is not a skill set that you invest a lot of energy into as an engineer because you don't make these transitions very often. And it's the same as I tell my clients, rather than seeking to become that expert during the process, go get help from an expert. So from your perspective, Seika, who is the person to reach out to first? Is it the recruiter? Is it someone like yourself who's in that occupation? Or is it a coach or someone who helps with resumes? Or where would someone go first if they need that guidance and that support on how to walk the process? Yeah, I think those are two two excellent ways. Uh, coach, going to a coach is a is a great strategy. Going to individuals who help with resumes, be uh, scrutinized, screen well to make sure that you're getting somebody who is invested in your process and who can help you get to where you're looking to go. A coach would be really helpful finding a headhunting firm that is very aligned with your experience can be a great way to get exposure, but keeping in mind that headhunting agencies, their customer is the company. So if if you have somebody saying, hey, I'll find you a job, pay me money, I, I haven't seen that be a successful method. There are coaches who can help you on your career search, uh, and that can be very, very fruitful. But I, I hesitate looking, finding, paying someone who can go find you a job. Yeah. Yep. That's a great heads up for people out there in this process, especially on LinkedIn, where there's someone on at every street corner saying they can support you in this. So pay pay attention. Seiko, there was one thing that we didn't touch on that you was so interesting. You mentioned it to me before we started recording today, and I know it's going to connect with the engineers listening because so many people here are high achievers. They're driven. They're goal-oriented. They, they connected with, with your uh, strengths finder assessment of achiever being at the top. And so what is this idea of, of happiness and achievement that you shared with me? Can you explain that really briefly for our people listening? 
Absolutely. I had the incredible opportunity to be part of Vance and Carol Ann Caesar's leadership program. And they have done their research, researchers based in Los Angeles, and they've done a lot of research on high achievers. And a very interesting finding that they found a while ago is that industry agnostic, high achievers' rates of happiness were statistically significantly lower than other populations in the population at large. And there, that was a real big disconnect because we have people who are ambitious and high achievers and very driven, and yet their happiness levels are uh, not in a place where you, you'd hope they'd be. And so they really program their life around creating happy high achievers. And I think that that can be something for your audience to listen to, being high achievers, to know that creating happiness in your life it, it's not just taking a bubble bath, right? Uh, Self-care, I'm using air quotes, every once in a while to kind of pick up your spirits. It's something that needs regular investment and commitment in every facet of your life in order to make sure that happiness is one of the things that you're achieving. Wow. There's so much to unpack there. But what I love is it's right in the heartbeat of why we're having this conversation. And I know why the engineers listening are here, this desire to be a happy engineer, but also to go get some amazing stuff done, like just, just to crush it and be at your best and perform. So I love this. And, and we're just going to get back together again and go deeper. So this is really great. So coaching, engineering, the work we do, one of the things that I believe in is a great questions lead and the answers follow. So ask great questions. Because if you ask a bad question, you're going to get a bad answer. So for the, the person listening who's just seeking that happy achiever, that happy engineering life, what would be the best question to lead them with? What's a habit that you can get passionate about? What is something that you can take from begrudgingly part of your life to something that's a thrilling hobby of yours. What is a habit you can get passionate about? I'm I'm wanting to answer this for myself right now. What an amazing question. Seika, thank you. Thank you. I know people are going to want more of your story to understand this amazing vegan voyage that you went on. Just uh, so many amazing parts of your life. Tell people where they can get connected with you and how to how to learn more. The easiest one, connect with me on LinkedIn. I'm on there all the time. And it's the easiest way to find and connect with all the things that I'm doing and at Astra. Awesome. And I'll put some things in the show notes for everybody and ways to get connected with Seik and Brian and their amazing team. And I'll tell you, this has been awesome. I'm energized. Thank you so much. And I would, for one, look forward to getting Brian on the show soon, but also Seika, there's just a whole wealth of topics from your life that would be amazing to unpack. So we'll have to do this again sometime. I'd love to. I'd love to. As always, it's a true pleasure to get to connect with you, Zach. Thanks for having me. Hello, my friend. Zach White here again. And I wanted to let you know that's all we've got for this episode of the Happy Engineer podcast. Thank you so much for investing your time with me today. It is an absolute pleasure to be able to bring you this content. Just as a reminder, it would be amazing if you would subscribe and share this episode with any other engineers you know who may benefit from this. And if you're like me, I hope that you'll take some notes and more importantly, take action. In our audio version of the podcast on Apple Podcasts and any place that you go to find podcasts, there's a little more content from me about this episode in the debrief. If you really want to hear about how to put this into action, I'd encourage you to go grab that. But thank you for joining us for the video version of our interview today. And again, can't thank you enough for helping us to get the word out about the Happy Engineer podcast and what we're doing. If there's any way we can serve you, would love to do that. Go find us at oasisofcourage.com or reach out to me on social media at Oasis of Courage. And don't forget again to subscribe and click the bell to have notifications of upcoming releases of new episodes of the podcast. As always, I want to leave you with this. If you stay in your comfort zone, you're not going to grow. So let's crush comfort create courage, and let's do this.